Okay, good morning, Angie, for you. We're going to continue on today here with Act 4, Scene 5, and we'll get through Scene uh, 6 and 7 as well and finish up this act. So we left off here right when um, they are uh, bombarded with some people from from the masses that are revolting against the king. They are in cahoots with Laertes. So let's just pick up from here. So the king will say, uh, the queen will say, alack, what noise is this? Where are my swizzers? So those are soldiers or palace guards. So it, it indicates that he is kind of afraid. Alack, what noise is this? Where are my switches? Let them guard the door. What's the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean, overbearing of his list, eats not the flax with more impetuous haste than young Laertes in a riot his head or bears or officers. The rabble call him law, and as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word they cry, choose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, hands and tongues applaud to the clouds. Laertes shall be king. Laertes king. <laughs> All right, let's read, let's read the annotation here. The rebellious people under Laertes' leadership overwhelm the guards just as overflowing oceans flood the land. So we can see that imagery. They are really uh, kind of bombarding the castle. And it's probably a good thing that the king is being cautious and being actually afraid, it sounds like. Um, the other thing that's uh, suggested here by this gentleman is that the crowd is demanding that Laertes Laertes uh, adopt the throne, get on the throne. They, of course, are unaware of the real details of Polonius's death. And it's an oversight of Claudius, for sure. He should have given the people some information, right? But he didn't. He was waiting to talk to the advisors so he could do some damage control. In the meantime, the people have... Um, piece together a story that maybe is not correct. And this is what Queen, Le uh, Queen uh, Gertrude is going to say next. She's going to suggest that they are on the wrong, tr wrong track, all of the citizens. How cheerfully on the false trail they cry. So she's comparing them to a bunch of hounds that are following the wrong scent. And she's suggesting here that they are falsely accusing Claudius. Of course, we know he's actually responsible for everything. And so she's incorrect in this, right? It's appearance versus reality, for sure. So how cheerfully on the false trail they cry, oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs. Let's take a look at this word counter in the annotations. Um, counter, the images of hounds following the wrong scent, i.e. wrongly accusing um, Claudius, but just a little bit up, antiquity forgot, history and order, established order, which are the source of authority, have been forgotten. So, so this here we see is um, uh, a reference to the chain of being, in that if they are demanding Laertes be king, well, Laertes is not the natural king. So she's saying that antiquity, um, where is that? Line 102. Antiquity forgot, and no, it's actually a gentleman that says this. Antiquity forgot and custom not known. So by this, he's saying this is ridiculous that Laertes is being demanded or the people are demanding Laertes be a king when he's not even the natural king. But the irony there, of course, is that Claudius isn't a natural king either, which is why, of course, everything in Denmark is in disarray. Yeah, that is what you're going to say, yeah. So there is irony there, right? They're demanding that an unnatural king be put on the throne, but there already is an unnatural king on the throne, which is, of course, why, why all of this disruption and poison, right? There is something poisoned in Denmark for sure. And it's Claudius. It's all Claudius. All right. So the doors are broke down, the king is going to say. A carefully on the false trail they cry, oh, this is counter, you false Danish god. The doors are broke. Where is this king, sirs? Stand you all without power. Oh, I pray you give me leave. I thank you. Keep the door. Oh, thou vile king! 
Give me my father! Calmly, courtly Ertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard! All right, so he comes in here right away as a man of action, right? Give me my father, tell me where his body is, and tell me why he's dead. Give me the information here, you vile king. Which is, of course, the truth. Cries cuckle to my father, brands the heart of even here between the chaste and smirched brow of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? So Laertes says, calm? You want me to calm down? When the only little bit of calmness in me has proclaimed me a bastard. A bastard is the term for a child without a father. And so he's calling himself a bastard because his father has died. So the king is going to um, get right to work here and grab control of this situation. He's going to do whatever he has to do to uh, be opportunistic and deflect any of the blame off of himself onto Hamlet. And as I said yesterday, he's going to uh, use this as an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. He's going to get the blame off of him and also get rid of Hamlet at the same time. He's going to plan something with Laertes. Let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. As such divinity doth hedge a king, that treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. All right, so let's take a look at the annotation here. There's such a king. So let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. Again, we see him talking in the royal we here. And he's alluding to the divine right of kings here. He's saying, Gertrude, I'm not afraid because this is a reference to the belief in the divine right of kings, which held that God would establish and protect the monarch. So he's saying, Gertrude, just let him go. I'm not afraid. I am the rightful king. I'm not worried. But we know he isn't the rightful king, and he actually should be worried because this is a tragedy and everybody dies. Okay. So then next he says that tr there's such divinity that doth uh, hedge a king. Talking about the divinity of the divine right of kings. I'm not worried. Uh, that treason can but peep to what it would. Treason can't hurt me, is what he's saying. He's, pre he's actually being pretty darn arrogant here. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Why are you thus incensed? Why are you so angry at me? That is my father. Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell, allegiance. Vows to the blackest devil. Conscience and grace to the profoundest pit. I dare damnation. To this point I stand. But both the worlds I give to negligence that come what comes, only I'll be revenged most truly for my father. All right, so here we really see some, um, um, some, some counter um, uh, to the character of Hamlet, right? He says, I vow to the devil, if I must, to fill my conscience and do the right thing. I don't care if I'm damned to hell. This is where I stand, and this is what I'm going to do. So he is ready to take revenge at any cost. Who shall stay you? My will, not all world. Who will help you in this? So already, Claudius has got a plan here. Who's going to help you do this, Laertes? And Laertes says, I don't need any help. My will is so strong in this that that's going to carry me as far as I need to go. And for my means, I'll husband them so well, they shall go far with little. Go. I'll manage them so well. But Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is strict in your revenge that swoop stake you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser. Mm. All right, so are you, um, are you prepared to, let's take a look here, is it writ, loser? Is it your intention to destroy both friends and enemies? And in this game where the winner takes all, so he's planting his little seeds of who is responsible and who isn't. So he's planting doubt in Laertes' mind. Do you want to proceed and kill innocent people too? Why don't you let me help you? I know the truth. None but his enemies. Will you know them then? To his good friends, thus wide I'll open my arms. 
and like the kind, life-rendering pelican, repast them with my blood. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman, that I am guiltless of your father's death. All right, so he goes right into it. Jack, you with us? All right, so let's take a look here. Laertes says, to my friends, to the people who are really honest, I'm not going to hurt them. He said, if anything, I'm going to ope my arms and like the kind life-rendering pelican, repass them with my blood. So like the self-sacrificing pelican, I'm going to feed them with my blood. Let's take a look at the annotation here. From the way she feeds the pelican, from the way she feeds her offspring, the pelican appears to be letting them eat her flesh. Therefore, the pelican was a symbol of self-sacrifice. So I'm going to self-sacrifice for my friends. And then the king says, well, now you're speaking truthfulness. Um, let me help you. I know the truth. I am not guilty at all. And I'm most sensibly in grief for it. It shall as level to your judgment peer as day does to your eye. Again, we know this is appearance versus reality. The, this is the opposite. He's actually kind of happy that this has happened because now he has a really good reason to get rid of Hamlet, right? I'm so grieved over your father's death. Yeah, no, he isn't. Hannah, what noise is that? Dry up my brains. Tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven, thy madness shall be paid by wit till our scale turns the beam. All right. So he says here, the revenge I take on those who caused your madness will be so heavy that it will tilt the scale of justice. He's actually referring here to fortune, the, the, the wheel of fortune. He's going to affect the wheel of fortune by how vehemently, how strongly he's going to take revenge for what's happening to Ophelia here. Dylan, that's really loud. <laughs> okay, so thy madness shall be paid by my weight, so I will revenge your madness. Rose of May, dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia. <laughs> oh, heavens, is possible a young maid's wit should be as mortal as an old man's life? Okay, so Ophelia's love for her father was so strong that she sent part of herself, her sanity, to go to the grave with her father. So, um... He's going to get revenge. Nature is fine in love. And where it is fine, it sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves. Fare you well, my dove. That's though thy wits and its persuade revenge. It could not move thus. You must sing a down, a down, and you call him a down. Oh, how the wheel becomes it. It is the false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than that. There's Rosemary. All right, so let's take a look at the song that Ophelia is singing. They bore him barefaced on the bier. That's a movable, a movable frame on which a coffin or corpse is placed before burial or cremation, on which it is carried to the grave. So they're talking. He's, she's talking about her father here. Um, hey, non, nani, hey, nani. On his grave rains many a tear. So, so lots of people are crying over the death of her father. And then she says, fare you well, my dove. Now it seems to be that she's talking about Hamlet. So she's, as I said yesterday, she's switching between her father and Hamlet. She's grieved by the loss of both of them, really. And Laertes said, oh, if you were sane and attempting to incite me to revenge, you could not do so as well as this sight is prompting me. So had thou, hadst thou thy wits and didst persuade revenge, it could not move thus. Seeing her like this is making him want revenge really, really badly. And then Ophelia sings some more. Um, oh, how the wheel becomes it. How the wheel of fortune has turned for her. 
that's for remembrance. Pray, love, remember. And there is pansies, that's for thoughts. All right, so she's going around like handing out flowers as if she's putting the flowers on the grave almost. So let's take a look at the annotation here. It says, each of the flowers Ophelia mentions has symbolic meaning, considering their symbolism, who might receive each one. So pansies from the French word pensée, pansies are a symbol of thoughts of love. Uh, fennel, which is another flower, symbol of flattery. Columbines, symbol of infidelity in marriage. So we can see here that she's, she's referring both to her father and sometimes here infidelity to Hamlet. Rue, symbol of repentance, being sorry. Herb grace of repentance. Um, a daisy, symbol of false promise of love. And violets, symbol of faithfulness. So she's struggling here in uh, in the loss uh, of both her father and the loss of the faithfulness of Hamlet. Document in madness. There's fennel for Thought you. Thought remembrance fitted. And columbines. There's rue for you. And here's some for me. We may call it her the Grace of Sundays. Oh, you must wear your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. Poor Bonnie, sweet Robin, is all my joy. Thought and affliction, passion, hell itself, she turns to favor and to prettiness. So again here, she's singing about her father. Um, will he not come again? But it also could be about, about Hamlet, right? Um, that he will never come again. His beard was white as snow, all flax, and uh, his pole, his scalp. He is gone, he is gone, and away we cast moan. God have mercy on his soul. Forgive him for his sins so that he can be accepted into heaven. So this next little bit of the song, she is talking mostly about her father, but some of it may be about, uh, about Hamlet. Beard was white as snow, Oh, and was his power. He is gone, he is gone, and we cast away now. Grandma, see on his soul. And of all Christian souls, I pray God. God, I. God, do you see this, O oh God? Laertes, I must commune with your grief, for you deny me right. Go but apart. Make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we call ours to you in satisfaction. All right, so this is really uh, quite um, convincing here, King Claudius. He says, listen, you, you can make your choice, but... Go, you can even go get your friends, your wisest friends, and have them come and listen. Because I promise you, if Gertrude or I are guilty in any way, I would gladly give my crown to you. So he's making quite a big promise here. Is Laertes going to fall for it? Unfortunately, he is. But if not, be you content to lend your patience to us and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. All right, so he falls for it. He's like, okay, uh, I accept that you have nothing to do with this and that you're gonna help me uh, jointly labor to fill the need in his soul for revenge. I'll give it due content. Like, we'll, we'll you know, make this happen. His means of death, his obscure burial. No trophy, sword, nor hatchment, or his bones. No noble right, nor formal ostentation cry to be heard as twere from heaven to earth. That I must call in question. So you shall. And where the offense is, let the great axe fall. I pray you, go with me. All right, so Laertes says, first though, I take great offense to the fact that my father didn't have a proper burial. He was an honorable man and he had high position. He deserved a ceremony, a noble burial. And he says, I take great offense to that. And he says, I, I need that fixed. And the king says, 
I will help you fix it. And we will make sure that whoever is responsible for it shall face the axe, the executioner's axe. So that's what he's saying here. And where the offense is, let the great axe fall upon him. And of course we know that he's talking about Hamlet. He's setting up um, Laertes to hate Hamlet and want revenge against him. Okay, so then the king says, take a look at his last line here. He says, I pray you go with me. This is very ironic because as you know, uh, the king can't really pray. So to cover up for Hamlet's actions, Polonius must have been buried secretly and without ostentation, usually associated with the funeral of such a high ranking minister. So Laertes has lots of problem with that. Uh, that his father didn't have this high-ranking ceremony for, for a burial, and he's going to make sure he gets revenge for who, on whoever is responsible for that. And we know that that is uh, Hamlet in the eyes of Claudius. Okay, let's take a look here. Act 4, scene 6. We see here a sudden turn of events. Hamlet has returned to Denmark. He never did make it to England. His ship was overtaken by pirates. They were good-natured pirates, and they treated him very, very well. Okay, so sailors have brought letters from Hamlet to Horatio and the king. From the letter to Horatio, we learn that Hamlet has escaped from the ship bound for England and has returned to Denmark. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have continued the voyage on to England. They are indeed going to be tragic figures here. Why does Hamlet leave them on the boat and he's going to set them up to face some kind of consequence? They were his friends. Um, they have no real choice but to listen to the king. And so it's kind of tragic, but they could have handled this a lot differently, right? Okay, so we see more of a focus on truth in this act, except for, of course, Claudius and Laertes. Okay, scene six. What is, what is the function of this scene? That's one of the questions. And I'm going to come right out and tell you that it has to do with the creation of suspense and building that suspense toward a climax. It's a quick little scene here. What are they that will speak with me? Sailors, sir. They say they have letters for you. Let them come in. I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted if not from Lord Hamlet. God bless you, sir. Let him bless thee, too. I shall, sir, and please him. Uh, there's a letter for you, sir. It comes from the ambassadors that was bound for England. If your name be Horatio, oh, I am let to know it is. All right, so Horatio says, there's a letter for me. Well, the only person it could be from is from the Lord Hamlet. Um, and the first sailor says, God bless you, sir. And Horatio says, let him bless thee too. So um, this is indeed quite a nice sailor. Uh, it, no doubt this is the pirate, one of the pirates, right? Again, it makes you wonder, did Hamlet set this all up? These are rather nice pirates. Horatio, when thou shalt have a look at this, give these fellows some means to the king. They have letters for him. And we were two days old at sea. A pirate of very warlike appointment gave us chase. All right, so Horatio, um, when you have finished reading this, make sure that these, uh, <clears throat> these sailors, these pirates, are able to hand the king some letters as well. So he's going to go and explain what happened here. Finding ourselves too slow to sail, we put on a compelled valor. In the grapple, I boarded them on the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. He alone became their prisoner? Hmm, interesting. So two days into the voyage, a pirate ship chased us. Um, we courageously uh, tried to outrun them, but they, fo they, forced, they were forced on us by the situation. They were, however, merciful pirates. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much haste as thou wouldst fly death. My words to speak in your ear will make thee dumb, yet are they much too light for the ball of the matter. These good fellows will bring thee where I am. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell. Neither thou knowest thine Hamlet. Come, I will give you way for these your letters, and do the speedier that you may direct me to him from whom you brought them. 
All right, so again, this is building suspense. What is it that Hamlet has to tell Horatio um, about the situation and about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, right? Um, so quickly, uh, I will give you a way to get to the king, Horatio says. So the quicker we deliver these letters to the king, the quicker I'll get to see Hamlet. This episode with the pirates seems pretty convenient. Do you think it's possible that Hamlet uh, set this all up? Okay, so again, the purpose of the scene, it builds suspense. The letter predicts strange news without revealing any real news, right? Um, Hamlet's not stupid. He knows that that letter could have been um, intercepted. All right, let's take a look here at the last scene. Act 4, scene 7. Um, this scene introduces a strong counterplot against Hamlet. It begins with Claudius convincing Laertes that Hamlet was responsible for Polonius's murder. The letter from Hamlet is delivered announcing his return to Denmark. Claudius manipulates Laertes into a plan to kill Hamlet in a dueling match. Laertes adds, the, adds to the plan by offering to put a deadly poison on the end of his sword. Claudius suggests a cup of poisoned wine as well. Again, very Machiavellian. He wants to make sure that, uh, that Hamlet's out of his hair, right? So he concocts a backup plan. He must maintain the throne. Um, Claudius suggests a cup of poisoned wine for Hamlet if the first plan fails. The conversation is interrupted by Gertrude, who announces that Ophelia is dead. She has drowned. Okay, so as suggested in the uh, little film that we that we watched, neither consider the feelings of Gertrude when they kill her son right in front of her. Yeah, Dylan. Also, um, you said the poison at this point in time would have been referred to as like a coward's weapon. I forget where I was. Yeah, um, you're right. No, you're absolutely uh, right. Nice, uh, nice point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the the woman's weapon or something. Yes, like you're right. Yeah, they used it in the nice. Nice observation, thank you. Okay, so it sets uh, it, it sets up Laertes to be a foil to uh, to Hamlet, right? In that Laertes is a man of action here. He's making this all happen. He's getting to his to his whole plan of revenge and making it happen. Okay, this plan makes Hamlet's death inevitable because there will be no escape from poisoned weapons. But Dylan, as you mentioned, it is a coward's way. Of, of getting rid of somebody, for sure. Okay, let's get right into this here and finish her up. Scene seven. Okay, so the king is gonna start off right away here with, now that you know the truth, Laertes, the real truth, you can confirm my innocence. Now must your conscience my acquittance seal, and you must put me in your heart for friend. Sith you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain pursued my life. It well appears. But tell me why you proceeded not against these feats so crimeful and so capital in nature, as by your safety, wisdom, all things else you mainly were stirred up. So the king here says, um, now you know the truth, and in fact you know that the person who killed your father pursued my life. So Claudius here has figured this out, that he really, that, Cla that Hamlet really was trying to kill Claudius behind that heiress, right? A rat, a rat. So Laertes says, well, if he tried to kill you, uh, why didn't you act um, like as treason, like punish him with death? And um, the king is going to respond, well, there are two reasons why, why I didn't, you know, kill Hamlet on the spot. Um, one of them is the queen, his mother, um, lives by my looks, like lives for me and I live for her. So he couldn't do that in front of her. And then number two, the other motive is the public. He didn't want to uh, put, the, put the public into um, a rage. Oh, for two special reasons, which may to you perhaps seem much unsinued, and yet to me they are strong. The queen, his mother, lives almost by his looks, and for myself, my virtue or my plague, be it either which, 
She is so conjunctive to my life and soul. We are so conjunctive, like closely linked to each other. I live for her, she lives for me. But he, but he also mentions that she lives for her son. She doesn't want to put, he didn't want to put her through that intense pain. But as the star moves not but in his fear, I could not but by her. The other motive, why to a public count I might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him who, dipping all his faults in their affection, would, like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convert his jives to graces. So that my arrows, too slightly timbered for so loud a wind, would have reverted to my bow again, and not where I had aimed them. All right, so convert his jives to graces, change his fetters to adornments, and make a martyr out of him. So he wasn't willing to take that risk. Um, the public's affection for, for Hamlet is so strong that my plan for dealing with him would be turned against me, just as an arrow that is too light would be turned back by a strong wind, missing the mark. So he didn't want to make um, Gertrude upset, and he didn't want to make the public turn Hamlet into a martyr. But, he says, um, okay, well, let's keep And so have I a noble father lost, a sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back against a challenger and mount of all the age for her perfections. Nobody was equal to her in time. My sister was perfect. But my revenge will come. Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it past time. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father, and we love ourselves. And that, I hope, will teach you to imagine. All right, so the king says, don't lose any sleep over that. We're going to figure this out. I've got a plan. Uh, and, and by the way, do not think I can tolerate insults because of danger. I, I won't. He says, I have a plan. You wait and see. I'm not going to let Hamlet get away with this. Oh, no, what news? Letters, my lord, from Hamlet. This to your majesty, this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say I saw them not. They were given to me by Claudio. He received them of him that brought them. Laertes, you shall hear them. Um, so the king here is genuinely surprised. Hamlet? Uh, he's supposed to be dead in England. Leave us. High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Meaning he's stripped of possessions. He's back in, De in Denmark, but he's stripped of his possessions. Naked in the kingdom. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes, when I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasions of my sudden and more strange return. Hamlet, what should this mean? Are all the rest come back, or is there some abuse? Or no such thing. So the king here is a little bit paranoid, like, what's going on here? How the heck did Hamlet escape? Um, know you the hand? Tis Hamlet's character, naked. And in a postscript here, he says, alone. So Laertes says, is it really Hamlet's hand? Like, did he really write that? And the king says, well, it sounds like his character. Um, his character is not respectful, no, no common decency, saying he's all naked with, in his pers pers uh, possessions. Can you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord. But let him come. It warms the very sickness in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth. Thus did us. I want to look him in the face, tell him, I did this to you. Warms my heart to think about revenge against him. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so? How otherwise? Will you be ruled by me? If so, you'll not all rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit now ripe in my device, under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death, no wind of blame shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. All right, I have a plan here. Listen to me, are you ready to do what I tell you? And Laertes says, uh, yes, but you'll never rule me to be uh, peaceful to that person who killed my father. You'll never convince me to be nice to Hamlet. And he says, look, I have, um, I have a plan that nobody will accuse us. No wind of blame shall breathe. Not even his mother shall uh, blame us for his death. 
My lord, I will be ruled. The rather, if you could devise it so that I might be the organ. It nemesis. He announces he's going to be Hamlet's nemesis. I'm going to be the one to kill him. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travel much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. Your sum of parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one, and that in my regard of the unworthiest siege. What part is that, my lord? A very ribbon in the cap of youth, yet needful too, for youth no less becomes the light and careless livery that it wears than settle age, his sables and his weeds, importing health and greatness. Some two months hence, here was a gentleman of Normandy. I've seen myself and served against the French, and they can well on horseback. But this gallant had witchcraft in it. He grew into his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse as he had been encorpsed and demi-natured with the brave beast. So far he passed my thought that I, in forgery of shapes and tricks, come short of what he did. A Norman was? A Norman. Upon my life, Le Monde. The very same. I know him well. He is the brooch indeed and gem of all the nation. All right, so the, the king here is saying, it is well rumored that you are an excellent fencer. Nobody is better than you. He said, the king says, except for this one guy um, that I encountered a little while ago, and he was wonderful. He was such an incredible fencer. But this particular person, uh, Laertes says, oh, that must be my this guy, Lamond, that I know. And he says, it is, it was. And the king is going to go on to say, but even that guy suggested you were a better fencer than he was. What is he doing? He's kissing his butt. He's trying to convince um, Laertes that he is the best fencer in the world. And then he's going to use that to convince him to fence against Hamlet. So he's just buttering him up, buttering him up right? Smoy, uh, blowing some smoke up his butt. He made confession of you and gave you such a masterly report for art and exercise in your defense and for your rapier most especially. He acknowledged your skill and superiority over him um, in fencing, especially in your double-edged sword use. That he cried out, "'Twould be a sight indeed if one could match you." The scrimmers of their nation, he swore had neither motion, guard, nor I, if you oppose them. Sir, this report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming all to play with him. All right, so when uh, this guy was talking about how much uh, of a wonderful fencer you are, Hamlet overheard it, and Hamlet was so jealous that he wished that he could duel you and prove the statement wrong, that he was a better fencer than you. Now, out of this... What out of this, my lord? Laertes. Was your father dear to you, or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Oh, I ask you this. Not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time, and that I see in passages of proof, time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love, a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it. And nothing is at a like goodness still. For goodness growing to a pleurisy dies in his own too much. So he's saying, did you really love your father? And there she says, what the hell are you talking about? Of course I did. And he says, no, no, it's not that I question whether you loved your father. It's just that I want to know, do you still have fury in your heart over his death? Are you going to do something about this? That we would do, we should do when we would. For this wood changes and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, our hands, our accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easy. But to the quicker the answer. Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son indeed, more than in words? What would you be willing to do to show that you still love your father so much and, and are going to fight for his revenge? to cut his throat in the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. But good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet return shall know you are come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you. Bring you in fine together and wager on your heads. 
he, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils, so that with ease, or with a little shuffling, you may choose a sword unbated, and in a pass of practice, requited for your father. Hi. All right, so this is his plan. He's saying, um, we're going to go to your chamber, go, go back to your home, and we'll tell Hamlet that you've come home and that you would like to have a friendly duel with him. Friendly duel. Now, because this is a friendly duel, Hamlet isn't going to look at the, examine the swords, but we'll make sure that one sword is poisoned. I will do it. I will do it, And for says. that purpose, I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountain bank, so mortal, that but dip a knife in it, where it draws blood, no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death that is but scratched withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion, that if I gall him slightly, it may be death. All right, so Laertes says, that's a good idea. I think we, I think we will do this. Um, and he says, for that purpose, I have, uh, I will put on the end of my sword a piece of, po a little bit of poison that I bought that is sworn to kill the person instantly. He says, I, I have a plan too. Yes, I'll go along with your plan to duel him, but my plan is that I'll put a little bit of poison on the end. Let's further think of this. Weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit us to our shape. If this should fail, and that our drift look through our bad performance, to a better not to say it. Therefore, this project should have a back or second that might hold if this should blast in proof. All right, so consider the best time and action to achieve our purpose when we're going to do this. And he says, you know, but if this blows up in our faces, we'll, we'll all be destroyed. So he says, um... We need a backup plan just in case this, this blows up. And this is where Claudius is going to come up with a backup plan. He's going to offer uh, Hamlet a poisoned cup of wine. Soft, let me see. We'll make a solemn wager on your cunnings. I have it. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end, and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the knots. Whereon, but sipping, if he by chance escape your venom stuck, our purpose may hold there. How now, sweet queen? One woe doth tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. All right, so um, he's a little bit param paranoid, but stay, what noise? He's worried who's listening in. And it's the queen, and she announces, when it rains, it pours. Your sister has, has drowned. Drowned? Oh, where? There is a willow grows aslant the brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There, with fantastic garlands, did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers. Yeah, she went to the river where there's willow trees. Call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes, as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. So she fell into the, um, into the river, um, and they caught all on her coronet, on her little crown or hat, and they pulled her down. And for a while she floated, and un unaware of what was happening, but eventually she sunk to the bottom. Uh, we're going to have a talk about that. Some, it's debatable. What mass, then? She is drowned. 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 <laughs> Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears. So literally and figuratively here, right? It's like she's cried so, so much, too much of water, but now too much of water has done her in as well. So I'll not cry Yet over you. Yet it is our trick. Nature her custom holds, let shame say what it will. 
When these are gone, the woman will be out. So at first he says, you've been in too much water. I'm not going to cry over this. And then he says, actually, it's a trick because as a human, I, I can't, it's a natural response. But then he says, when I finish crying, I'm going to get my revenge. Adieu, you, my lord. I have a speech of fire that fain would blaze, but that this folly doubts it. Let's follow, Gertrude. How much I had to do to calm his rage. Now, fear I, this will give it start again. Therefore, let's follow. So he says, I will act like a hardened real man when these tears are extinguished. When, the, when I'm done crying, these tears will be the last signs of womanly behavior in me. Um, and he says, I'm eager to uh, give the fire hell speech that I want to give right now, but I can't give it because I'm crying. But I will get my revenge. So then um, the king ends up saying, I had to do a lot to get him all riled up in control of his rage, but now that he's crying, I might have to manipulate him all over again to get him back to the place where he's angry. All right, and so that is the end of scene seven.